the Habib Singh Podcast. Bye, Ji Ka Khalsa. Bye, Ji Ki Fateh. Well, we're going to go straight into it. No introductions. I'll have your intro in the description box. Now, fake Babe or fake Motawa is probably a like a really contentious description of somebody. And before we started recording, you said something really beautiful. I was hoping you could share that to start off with. Yeah, I don't mind. So I think the conversation we had it reflected this belief that we have where we've either got real. And, and, and fake and we draw these polarities across the, the reality is just when we reach out to anyone for spiritual help we can catch them at any point in their journey and um, we might catch them at a point where they are on a high uh, and, and and be taking on that high with them or we can catch them when they start falling to all of the things that and Gurbani tells us people even the most spiritually accomplished can fall to so I think you know, and also the the kind of labels and stuff moving away from then. I think as individuals looking to get into Sikhi, if we're aware of what some of these things are, uh, and maybe what some of the flags to look out for are, and what healthy boundaries and practices are, and understand those for ourselves and look out for our own families. I think there's so much to learn from so many people, but perhaps we just need to review the ways in which we do that and how, as a community, we bring safeguarding in. Can you take a deeper dive into that? I know it's a very broad topic and there's probably lots of different aspects, like thinking of my wife, for example, she would go to Ranspanya and she would go and stay the night in you know in places when she was quite young. Or um, there might be other scenarios where someone goes off to India without their parents and they're staying in India for a while. I did that at Darbar Saib. I stayed there by myself. So this is quite a wide topic in terms of safe yeah. planning. But just as an overarching description, can you give any advice? So I think best practice in the sense of, um, you know, in Sangat, that growing up, many people grew up that same way, either from camps or um, learns wise and, you know, like Dribal is still a relatively safe place. Like, you know, it's when you're something that in the sticks traveling around India is, 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 is different. It's actually, you know, in recent times we've learned of some of the challenges that people had, some of the trauma that people faced, and some of the ways in which, you know, people exploit those situations. Um, and I think it does call for a bit of a review in that. I'll give you an example. Um, you know, if you're doing business with someone and, you know, people, if you trust someone, that person's verbal word, that person's verbal agreement, it, it means a lot. It goes a long way. But you still have a contractual agreement because you know it's best practice and you know it and you know it protects both parties. So things like, you know, if you are staying around, okay, the children in one room, the adult being in the other room, it's not a case of distrust, it's that respect, or you know, the way that sleeping arrangements, the way that living arrangements are done. Um, it's a done from a mutual respect. It doesn't need to be based on that trust or mistrust. It, it should be done on the basis of we know bad things can happen at any time. Um, and let's just try and be uh take whatever reasonable steps we can to prevent that. The India thing, I think it's something that loads of people do, you know, just going out there on your own and discovering the place, the guru cars and, and the culture of the place. Um, staying in one place is good. Uh, staying in place, to be honest, like staying around the bar side or around the side, like if you're there, you're staying in a comedy. And I think that's one of the safest things to do. Uh, and obviously when you're traveling out and about, like, we're always going to be naive to that place, to that culture and what ha- and what happens within it. You know, I think the, the most sensible thing you can do is take proper advice and guidance from those that have spent time out there. And if they tell you not to go somewhere <laughs> or be careful, that then, then take it. Huh? It's just, it comes from that ability to share experience um, on these things. That makes a lot of sense. And I, I feel like if you were going anywhere like Mexico or Argentina or picking on South America, but china you'd probably do the same things you'd probably speak yeah. to someone who's been there you'd probably look on TripAdvisor and see whether that place has anyone's had any bad experience there around safety and then you'd make judgments and form an itinerary based on that i know people who've come up to south africa johannesburg they, they're very cautious and they 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 know which areas to go and not which not to go and and if someone is a bit shady just following their gut feeling and sticking to the people they know, the places that they uh, that, are. That, that's it, isn't it? It's the, it's the, the, 
the, it's the sensible things to do, I think, isn't it? I think that makes sense for when you're going to India and if you're going to Sthans, you're doing a Yatra and you're maybe on your own or you're with somebody who doesn't know India too well and maybe the cultural differences and the etiquette differences. With, I've been in scenarios where you have um, like a, a Gurmukh or a Sant who's come down and then they'll, they will have individuals in a room with them by themselves. So it may be like a young baby goes into a room by herself. And I, going back to what you said earlier around sleeping arrangements and not saying that anything bad would happen, but just thinking from a safeguarding point of view, is that appropriate to put anybody in that position where there they could be allegations, even if they haven't done anything wrong? It's about safeguarding everybody involved, not just the, the vulnerable person. So I think there's probably two sides to that. One is if we look at what the traditional values were in the Sikhi, and the other side is actually what we're dealing with in contemporary society. So I think if we look at, for example, the Sikhi side of things, you know, I... Um, come from the Nahang Singh order and, and I've done kind of seva growing up of Baba Jaginder Singh Ji. And women are never allowed on their own near them. You know, there always has to be a Singh, there always has to be a bit of that. And that to some people might seem extreme, but that's there to safeguard the, the reputation of the mob work, the organisation and, and, and the Sangha because maybe they just might, someone could just feel uncomfortable in that space. Um, so that's one side of it. But actually, even going further, there's a story of Baba Deep Singh Ji when the Singhs had rescued the women uh, as they were being taken, as they'd been kidnapped from India and been taken to uh, Afghanistan. And one of the, the women, she was a very pretty lady and she was very famous. Her fame was renowned. And, and the younger Singhs went to Baba Deep Singh Ji and said to them, like, you're going to have to um, escort this one we'll split the other ones up but some of the things are a bit worried about this one she's a famous lady she's a well known lady she's got a renowned reputation like we don't want to handle that and Baba these things you said I'll do it but Panji Singh have to come with me and they were you know Brahmgyan they were one with the divine being but they're living by setting an example so I think that's the historic example where not just with between men and women, but probably with young children and other vulnerable people, we should adopt that best practice because our ancestors gave it to us. And then the second thing, if we look in contemporary society, if we look at you know some of the horrific stuff that's happened in religious institutions, we should be forward thinking about how how are we going to stop that happening? Because you know we have to look at our next generation and make sure that. Sangat is a place that they can come to, that they can enjoy their Sikhi, they can enjoy their Renswai, they can enjoy their kids' camps, and all these things are happening. And that there's policies, there's an understanding, there's, there's, there's best practice in place to ensure these are safe spaces, because if Sikh spaces aren't safe spaces, we'll lose, um, we'll lose entire groups of people who, who, who won't feel safe coming there, won't feel safe the children going there. So I think when you measure up what society we live in and what's going on, and, and what the traditional Sikh ethos is on those things, I think should be it shouldn't be too difficult to come to sensible common ground on best practice. I really like that story. I have never heard that before, and I find it quite profound. And the second thing is everything you've said has very been very well articulated and makes complete sense. It almost makes you think, why aren't we doing that already? If you had a magic wand, and you were in charge of the bunt. Um, <laughs> and you could you could make rules on institutions. What would it look like? It would, for every institution. Every institution serves the bunt. The the bunt was the bunt was given the everything by Guru Maharaj, wasn't it? Grant Pant Kalas of Ratanta the uh, you know, so many other sayings in Barney Rudy were Maharaj because I've given everything to the Pant. Everything is this. So like these institutions, these organizations, these astans, these land, they're asking institutions, institutions run them on behalf of the Pant. That's that's my understanding. In when it comes to the organizations that we work for, what are the things that we see that work there? We see their policy, we see there's audit, we see there's external view. Like, why is institutions are we afraid to open ourselves up to that? 
why are they not, you know, okay, have you got your health and safety certificate? Have you got your books and audit? Have you got your safeguarding policies best in place? Is there an external place somewhere can go to complain to if they, they've got a concern about this? Like, why is that not the thing, God, buddy? Why is a local community? We come to these spaces, we use these spaces, do we not see are all these patches in place? Who Who's the accountability to? Because in most of God, the accountability is to a group of trustees who, if they don't like what's going on, can kick out the sangha, can kick out the committee and just sell the building. And, you know, that really, I think, stems from our traditional way of living, where we maybe came from communities where um, some people had power and other people just accepted it, or, you know, in village type scenarios where you have maybe a few people where the control is centralized and other people, and it's never really challenged. But actually, I think those of us that when we're educators, that when we work in other environments and we get exposed to how other institutions and organisations run, like you just think, would it not be a lot better if organisations were run the same way? If people could be safe, if people um, could be uh, in those places and encouraged to to thrive, to grow. I'll give you an example. One of my employees that I joined recently, on the, when I joined uh, straight away, I'm just meet. Uh, with Barna, I introduced myself and what, what the kind of, you know, because it gets rid of that uncertainty around me. What does he believe in? Why is he dressed like that? You get rid of all of that. And then what's the culture of the company? We encourage inclusivity. We want people to be themselves. We want you to bring your authentic self. We want you to look where you can add value. Is that not, should you not go to the God and see what Seva can do? We want you to feel belonging. Should you not be able to go to the God and say, okay, that's my Seva? I can go serve longer, I can go wash dishes. And I think that sense of community, that sense of Sangdib, um, you know, a lot of people when they were younger growing up in Sikhi, especially in small towns, saw a lot of that. But now the way that God got here run, I don't see a lot of them run in that same sort of in- inclusive, open way either. I, I love what you're saying. And it reminds me of a book called Belonging. It's by a professional athlete. He worked with the South African rugby team and he, he's worked with cricket teams as well. And in South Africa, they had the division, obviously, between the blacks and the and the whites. And um, this was during apartheid and the segregation. And in professional sports, I think prior to the, the now South African team, they had the Springbacks, which was an all-white team. Even the, the anthem was racist. And when they brought this team together, when they created a mixed team, they needed to create a culture, a new culture for South Africa, which was inclusive. And in the in the story, he talks about when one of his coaches once slapped him on the backside of his head and, and said an insult to him. And he said for the next 10 years, the, the coach was as sweet as anything to him, would give him lifts home in the rain and was really kind and supportive. But that trust, that that feeling of safety which is really important for leaders to create within their teams was gone after that point in time and he said he could never perform within that team because he never felt 100 percent safe because of what the leadership had done so i think that's just one small experience it's a great book and but it talks about the power of belonging and when you believe in us and whoever that us you identify and if it's us as in Sikhs and you feel like you belong to that group. The things you can achieve are just incredible. And what you can achieve as a collective in South Africa, they have this place called Ubuntu, which is, you know, what can you do for your fellow person, the, the fellow person in the us? So I think you're right. If we create these systems or look at what systems are working to create a positive culture, then people are going to be able to achieve the potential in Sikhi, uh, as well as feel comfortable sending their kids somewhere and all of that. And I think people just need those spaces, don't they? Like the, when people come together and they have that sense of belonging, you know, miracles happen in that space just by the sheer will of, you know, humans collectively, humbly, <laughs> because working together, because we've only really, as a species, we've like, how long have we been regulating our behavior? Um, you know, workplace, coming into office environments. This is a relatively, you know, last 100 years, last 50 years, last 40 years, you know, and if you just look at, for example, sexual discrimination, maybe where it was, 
however many years ago to where it is like it's not it's not um it's it's probably still there but it's not acceptable you can't have that level of banter you banter you know if you want to call it that you can't say certain things you can't harass people the, these things have to be legislated against recognizing that if we want to get the best out of people and for them all to feel comfortable we have to create some regulation around that and i think we do that and you know we do that in other we do that you know when we work somewhere we want someone out of, out of uh we want an organization that aligns to our values. If our children go to school, we want to make sure the school's got these types of things in place. I just think we haven't really given that same level of thought and input into our Gordari. Yeah, I think from what you're saying, from Baba Deep Singh's G's time, from historical times, there was a kind of hierarchy or a system of accountability. If you had an issue, you'd probably go to the bunch of you, would probably go to the Sings, the senior Sings, and say, this is happening. And they would probably address it in in real time. <laughs> <laughs> and now over time, that seems to be diluted into committees and Gurdwara committees where it's a little bit inaccessible. I, I don't know the committees in my local Gurdwara, and we have three. So I don't know anybody in that committee and have had no contact or communication with them. So then we have gone from this traditional system to this new system. And from this new system, we're probably, maybe there are some people who are resistant saying that's not the right way. This Western way isn't the right way for us. We should stick with this committee system. But that wasn't always the system either, right? We had Panjabi, we had Elder Gursik. So that's, yeah. that's uh, I think, an interesting dynamic because I know from people who run committees, I know there's Jai in... GMP Gudwara in Coventry, they, there is a lot of, whenever they try and implement anything new, they do get a lot of pushback from the, the kind of traditionalists. But it's just resistance to change, isn't it? When you work, again, you know, in any, any environment and you try and do something new, there's a whole part of it called change management, a big part of it. Like it's, just, it's, just, it's just human nature. Sometimes you think you're going up a generation or, and it is all of those things. But it is also actually just the ability to recognize this is something new, maybe a new way of thinking or a different way of thinking. And that first going to make people uncomfortable. You have to kind of socialize with it. And then what, what happens? It then just works to a point where you try and be, you, you for it get forced, doesn't it? This is the change. You're socializing. We're taking people's feedback. Um, and then you kind of implement that. And that's part of, I think, what, what leadership is. I think you know there's some great, as you mentioned, there's some great stories coming out of some of the God Day where young people are getting involved and actually recognizing that it's it's not a young people come and take over thing. It's actually an older generation who did an amazing job coming to this country without even knowing the language to then get to a place where they've built up huge community facilities. Um, but then it's maybe for the next generation, and it might take a generation to to actually, you know what, the old culture the old generation understood buying land and building something and have just kept doing that model. Maybe the next generation is the one that comes in and says, actually, we understand um, the outside world a bit better and, and how to work within that. Well, just to circle back on something you were talking about earlier around labelling and the, the fake Baba label or the Mahapurk label who, who can't do anything wrong. And there's... What are the signs of symptoms that a family or a young person might be able to think, well, I need to, maybe I gave my all in this situation and maybe I need to just be a bit cautious or I need to speak to somebody about something and just get another opinion? So um, you meet more fakes on your journey than, than, than real. And actually even maybe fakes is the wrong term. There's, you know, however many million Sikhs in this world and, and you might go to one of them for help. Reality is when you look at Gurbani, um, Gurbani tells you that the virli, that those that have actually taken the essence from the teaching um, and, and transformed themselves from within, uh, taking to that, they're rare. <laughs> they're really rare. And actually for a Sikh part of you, part of, you know, when you, you're seeking is to actually seek out these people. Um, and actually, you know, 
the things that we encounter oh har kaise hand na kiya banaras ke thag like don't call those people saints that are thieves like, you you realize that on your journey and then you see that gurbani or you know the religious hypocrites you you know for me i i see now some things when individuals have these experiences with bad persons and it, it throws them off of sikhi but actually if you go to what guru sahib says guru sahib is telling you you're going to see all of these things as as part of your journey um and i think in terms of saying to the cat for it's things like the people think like it, as an individual how does someone carry themselves the first thing to look at is look at someone's jeevan look at what time someone waking up what time are they going to sleep what's their nitya name how long have they been doing it um, and what's their practice because if like we we are peers right you're in your thirties i'm in my thirties we are peers we've grown up in the same culture we've grown up we are we are kind of still trying to work things out and one really and truly is people that are going to be maybe 40s 50s 60s they have maybe worked through some of life got an understanding of it and on top of that have built a long time of sadhana and a long time of sadhana maybe 30 40 years that's the kind of people I, I, I've kind of now got an interest in in meeting and and they'll tell you the things they'll tell you what you know I'll give you an example from Baba Ji Indra Singh and I'll use that because I can use that in, in my own life and I'm sure other people can use that in their life of what maybe good practices and maybe what are flags to look out for so things like infallibility you know Baba Ji will always tell me we can make mistakes and it in as quick as the mind moves you know it can make it can do so much in less than a second in that space we can make so many mistakes that we don't even know and comparing that in my life to maybe being around individuals who carry themselves away with the creedian environment where it's not acceptable to see them in such a light that they are able of, to make a mistake um, so that's one side thing the other side so you've got the person's jeevan the person's life the way they carry themselves you've got the person's you know are they are they practicing humility and in doing so teaching you that or are they creating a hierarchy that's them on top and, and you below the next thing is money so again from an hang saying one of the things they say is an hang saying never asks for money an hang saying should never ask for money your life is devoted to the guru and you eat whatever the guru gives you because part of being an hang saying it's like being a fakir it's like being a we're, we're beggars of god and whatever we want we'll ask god and if it means going hungry if it means suffering if it means whatever so be it that's that's the kamai of an hang saying um that's what makes it special <laughs> so for me money like i'll give this one two places if i can see okay a gurdwara is getting built here a taksal is getting built here there's a school running here if i've been there if i've been there if i've seen what's happening i can put my money into that but to people that will put you under pressure to give them money or to use your money to maybe things that you're unsure about where it's going for me that's a flag um the next thing is people that separate you from you and your family um so I remember when i was quite young once um i used to my my village was quite near to lakaba so i used to go daily and then the first time they were going on a jorde mela which is when they go away they stay for a couple of days camp out on horses it's, it's exactly the kind of thing as a young young boy you want to do but my mom was like you're not going and i was like this is devastating right uh, you know you experience those things as a teenager and i remember there's an old nang singer man and he said to me but mara bada roop hundi ya your mom's like god don't think you come here to these things you going to run off into that your mom's telling you doesn't want you to go your mom's like god you need to you need to realize that lesson and learn that lesson and actually there will be so many people in your life that you'll encounter who go try and cause um friction between your relationship break your grounding um so someone to actually cement that and that that's wisdom you know there there plenty of other people who might have given bad advice in those situations so look after your money look after your family look at what someone's given is and never been in an environment where you're not able to criticize but be be humble in knowing that you'll never always recognize either 
So, you know, I'll give you an example of, of Baba Prem saying there's, there's two or three things they used to say to nearly everyone and used to set people up deliberately. One would be, um, one of them was about when people would come to the Gorda, they would say, how much do you earn? Right? And straight away, someone's on their back foot. <laughs> the son's going to ask me how much I'm earning. He's going to whack out a fair number and then say, right, you can afford to give me this much. That's what you think, isn't it? <laughs> And some people would obviously they would respond in a hesitant, reserved way, right? Mm-hmm. One of my friends that happened to him as well. And he goes, oh, um, I do okay for myself with you still, but you know, I kind of like grounded response. And he goes, Oh, you do okay for yourself then. So how come you've come to the Godara wearing a t-shirt and shorts like that's underwear? Can your parents not afford proper clothes for you or something like that? And there's a total slap on the face. And what, what he says is, he goes, you've come to see Guru Maharaj. Guru Maharaj is a king. And you've come here, like, dressed in your, like, casual clothing. Like, this is the one place you wear your best clothes when you come. You have that respect. But the way they used to set people up, you know, and I, I, I remember I said it once to, I once I said it to him, I was like, Baba, if you were just a bit nice and how you said it, he goes, I don't care. He goes, I don't want these people's money and these people's following. He goes, they've come here to Mother Day. They've come to see me for five minutes. I'm going to give them one teaching. And that's to slap them across the face with have more respect for your guru when you come and see them. He goes, I've only got one teaching to give them. I don't need them to come back to me. <laughs> so it's like, you know, be humble as well. But, you know, where I gave four or five flags there, if if several of them are triggering at the same time, then you, you might want to reach out to someone. Uh, I love it. Excellent. I was I was watching the documentary. I've been getting into Scientology recently in terms of watching the documentaries and, and finding out a bit more about that because I was hearing about that. And uh, all of those things were covered. All of the things that you said were covered. So I think if anyone is in the Scientology the community, they should definitely listen to you. But outside of that as well, if if someone you know they're saying the average spend being a Scientologist is a quarter of a million in order to go through their levels of spirituality uh, and to get the books and access to the resources and you think well if a religion or if a group is only open to people who are really wealthy then is that egalitarian is that how God would or Guru Sahib would make it the system to be and the second thing was around um, family so one of the things is if you're not if you do anything against the group then you are not allowed to speak to anybody um you know no one is allowed to speak to you so you're classed as an sp which means a, a some some person which is basically banished from that group banished from any interactions with anybody from that group so you have lots of fathers not talking to their sons anymore uh, and you have loads of um, parents who've never seen their kids after after being having left the church so I think all of those things are really important and from a safeguarding perspective if you do have regular communication with your parents if you have a relationship which you can be open with and say you know this is going on or this isn't going on then that's all potentially protective uh, money wise as well if you're like you said the swan that you want to give it to somewhere that you feel like it's going to be used well but you don't want to be pressurized into um, making a donation so i think those are that was a beautiful summary of of those issues um just to add my spin on it and my personal experience there's been a few scenarios where i felt like my gut feeling was that this is not right and i think sometimes when somebody's in a situation uh, their gut will speak to them or their spirit, however you want to define it, will tell them that something is not right here. And I think it's important to just have a conversation with somebody at that point, it's particularly if you're young and vulnerable, if you're kind of pre-20 and you maybe haven't really got that much life experience, it's worth having a conversation with somebody, like you mentioned, who's older. And another thing I really wanted to add is around what you said around seeking out mentors who are in their older years and there's a chinese saying that 
you're a beginner till you've got 60 years of experience in something. So from a medical perspective, if you do acupuncture, you're classed as a, a beginner, not even a novice, until you have 60 years of experience. So from a Sikhi perspective, if we if we felt like, you know, prob- people should probably have been doing this for a while to have gone through those life experiences and, and gathered that experience, then... then uh, I think that's very protective as well. Definitely, yeah. So that was amazing. Okay, everyone I know that is really doing really well in Sikhi, doing a lot of bar, doing a lot of Simran, doing a lot of Seva, they've got a mentor. So this, the purpose of this, and you haven't done this, but the purpose of this was not, not to put people off the kind of Baba, um, the title, because yourself, myself, Everybody I know, Darshan Kaur, they've had a mentor who's really pushed them and helped them grow personally. And without them, I don't know, I don't know where I would be. I'd probably be in the gut yeah. somewhere. And you know, Darshan Kaur wouldn't be where she is if it wasn't for the mentor that she's had. So this I think Gurbani is- Gurbani tells us to seek that person out. And really, what is the role of that mentor? You know, Gurbani is filled, whether it's in praise of the Sant, the Brahmgyani, the Gursik, the Gurmukh, it doesn't distinguish on the language, essentially. It's talking about that person who's realised, or if even if not fully realised, has maybe mastered, if not mastered, is at least a significant amount ahead of the way that they know maybe what you're going to go through. They're the things to look for. And that person, you know, in Gurbani, it says that the person that, takes you to God, see that person as God, as the person who realized God within themselves. And, you know, har har that Hari, that divine being, now operates through that person because they've become their servant. And that's beautiful, but it's probably the, it's probably the teaching that allows a lot of exploitation to, to take place as well. Because when you, when you realize that and you find that person, that person's only telling you two things, three things maybe. Do your Simran, yeah. Go to Guru Granth Sahib for for guidance. Keep humility by serving the Sangat. They are the sort of three or four key things as a Gosik that every Mahapurk and every Sampradha will tell you. Do your Simran, mm-hmm. serve the Sangat, and you know keep keep humility in these types of practices and putting Guru Granth Sahib Ji first. And to me, that's the signs of even if someone is not a realized, elevated Brahmjani, Mahapurk or, or practicing Gursik, just sticking to those things, you're not going to go far off. That's beautiful. And I think that's another sign and symptom as well. If you've got somebody who's maybe saying that, but then attaching you to themselves, saying you need to do this for me, you need to do that for me, you need to give me this much money, or or you know, you need to get your daughter married to me, or something like that. Or drive me around, that was a popular one for a while. Drive me around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All of those types of things, then I think that's potentially another sign and symptom. So I think in summary, we're trying to say that Baba isn't necessarily a bad thing, and it's definitely not a bad thing. There's two sides of the coin here. There's, like you said, these people are villi. They're few and far between, probably one in a million. But they're out there. And it's important to seek them out. Gurbani tells us to seek them out. And when we find them, it will change our life. But it should change our life for the better. If we're coming out with more vichar, we're more dukhi, we're, we're broke. <laughs> and... <laughs> and uh, you know, we've got all of these issues, then potentially like something went wrong somewhere along the way. So if you if people heed your advice and, and this, the kind of signs and symptoms of the safeguarding stuff that you've illuminated, I think it will go a long way in terms of pr- protecting our youth and protecting ourselves. And I think we are vulnerable because we are British born, new to I, I was not a Sikh all my life. So I got into Sikhi when I was around 21. So the, there's potentials to kind of join a group, to want to be part of a group. And then you maybe don't have the, the experience or the know-how or the awareness to think that actually, like you said, it is really, it's really important to be discerning and look out for, you know, those signs. 
and I think that it's okay to be part of a group as well. Like, you know, with a group, what you have is when everyone's worshipping worshiping or practicing or devoted in a particular format, that can be very, very powerful um, with that consistency. But actually what I would advise is make sure you've got friends who are part of other groups. Make sure within every group within, there's a coming of people there's always going to be some inherent contradictions within that. There's always going to be um, parts of that that you maybe think, you know what, just by default, by being a group, there's going to be things that I don't want to be susceptible to. Group think being a big one. Um, you know, that's not nothing to do with the sun or the marble. That's just got to do by people coming together and all starting to think the same way and not challenging one another on, and, and establishing core beliefs that actually might not be what the sun sector is trying to tell them. That stuff happens in every group. So, you know, just realising that in groups you have these things that will emerge and having friends from other types of groups so you can appreciate how diverse and beautiful the key is. I think that will also stop you from becoming overly sort of fundamental about whichever your own group is. And that's probably, depending on what you think, is that another sign? If your group is saying all the other groups are bad and we're the only right one, and we have this person or we have this ideology and so you shouldn't associate with anybody else again that's kind of separating you from your from your family or your friends your yeah contact. it happens to be honest that's something that the followers of nearly every group do well if i'm honest um it's it's a it's a it's an inherent symptom i think you know do your own historical research on these things um but actually also doesn't matter, like, you know, we look at Brahmganis, do we think Brahmganis are only in, even in Sikhi, we're talking about manners, do we not think there could be realised people of other religions out there? But if we find a home somewhere and that home gives us access to it, then that's what, that's what we're there to use it for, isn't it? It's not to bigger or better or the more special, like, the thing that's special is Rab, the thing that's special is Guru Maharaj, Anyone who, who illuminates that within himself, that's what special is. It's not these worldly things of someone being higher, or lower, or more important, or, or any of those things. That just leads itself to ego, I think. It's an interesting one, because I was watching another documentary about a different group, and there were, there were allegations and there was a lot of evidence against this person. But the followers were saying, even if he has done this stuff, we still think he's God. And yeah. we will still follow him. So they must have got some, they must be getting something out of it to have that kind of you, that, you know what, in that person. I think that through spiritual practice, people can develop um, extraordinary um, mental abilities. Uh, if, if we use that term, whether that's a sensitivity to their environment, whether that's ability to destructure their own cognitive um, faculties or inner energy. And, and from that, you will see um, you know, people that have done that type of practice, that type of sadhana, that type of abhyas. There will be an air of something a bit different about these people. In my, my experience, sometimes you, you can encounter that. But the stages that that person's going through is fraught with challenges where you're going up against Maya the whole time, <laughs> the, the very existence, the delusion, and Maya is there to trip you up. It doesn't matter if you're on step one or step 99 and nearly there. Maya is there to trip you up and can trip anyone up at any time. And actually having that humility and awareness that we're all trying to overcome that Maya that Brahmatma created as well, I think that gives you, it helps you not rationalise, but maybe just come to terms with why some of the things that happen that we think shouldn't do do happen. If we can pivot and talk about something that we, we've talked about in the past, which is probably a sensitive, another sensitive topic, was around abuse being cyclical. So I just wanted to touch on it, and you may not have anything to comment on it, but I think it's easy to say that somebody is really bad because they've done this and I'm not disagreeing with that 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 act may be bad I know I'm being very vague here but those people Darshan Kaur being a psychologist her having worked with people who have abused and who often have been abused themselves 
she has taught me that it's often cyclical. So, you know, if a parent beats his children, that child may grow up then to hit his own children. It, sometimes these things can be cyclical. So I think it's important to some, maybe some individuals need help. It's not just about demonizing them as this person is evil. It may be what that person knows. Yeah, I think so. I think maybe just anecdotally, obviously, I don't have the, the I, I, I did a year of psychology, but just to get a ground understanding in it, not, not obviously to that depth. Anecdotally, I think with all sorts of trauma, um, there are cycles and, and patterns uh, that repeat themselves. And if what happens is, I think it's like someone, someone's abused in a way, right? Um, anything from sexual abuse to economic abuse or, or these things. Just look at the response in that person. That person's going to get hurt. That person's going to feel pain. That person's probably going to go through a, a phase of bitterness, right? So many things are going to happen. That person maybe will go for a um, searching for justice and not get that. Like that person's going to go through a whole cycle of pain. Um, well, some people do. Sometimes what other people do is they shut off completely and, and they lock themselves in and they um, almost ignore that part of their mind um, that's uh, been affected by it or isolated it or boxed it away and, you know, suffer or start suffering from some forms of disassociation or memory loss. And, and you know, it will it will start to affect how they live their life on a day-to-day -day basis fundamentally. And the blockages and energy that those types of things create will really affect someone as well. Now, different things can happen there. When you realize or come to terms with what's happened, then you can see that pattern. You can identify the effect that it had on you. You can realize that actually is part of human beings. One of the way we learn is by observing behaviors. So we've seen someone do something, part of our mind just has learned that behavior and then has to, even if it's just, let's just take anger because it's a soft one. If someone's grown up seeing an angry father, for example, they need to realize that I've seen that behavior growing up and that behavior was normalized. That means, you know, you, you watch out for those things. So I think trauma and the way that people grow up and what they grew up with, that puts something in them that stays. And that thing can lead itself to emulating those behaviours. That thing can lead to an inner transformation that will take you to something beautiful because you, you've had to overcome something so powerful within yourself. Um, but patterns of behaviour and abuse and cycle it almost spreads, you know, sometimes where you even have communities where there was maybe one person who abused a group of followers. And as it spread, abuse became normalized through the institution. Mm. It was never challenged. It was never called out. It was seen as acceptable. It was part of the culture, essentially. It was normalized. That sounds like it went on a bit of a waffle, but it, it's a quite a hard subject. I can't word it, but, you know, I work, um, you know, my you know, save up with the Sikh community and you get people coming to you with some stories. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's so obvious there's a pattern. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's so apparent. Sometimes it's in certain groups, it's the same pattern. And you realise what happened 15, 20 years ago in that group and what's, what's, what are those people going through now? What's, what, what are some of them now doing? And, what's and it's, it's, you, you can really draw links between some of it. It's quite troubling but to me, I think that's what triggered the conversation, isn't it? That if we can identify those patterns and and really try and tackle them, that it, it, it can maybe have that sort of generational healing effect as well. And this is not really related, but with my family and friends, I know of people who've suffered from alcoholism. And it, it's heartbreaking because you might see somebody's mother pass away from alcoholism and then you see the daughter doing the same stuff and then getting ill off it. And you think, but look what happened to your mom. Can, isn't it just so I think It's completely related, honestly. I think it's, it's they're very similar things, you know. 
but it, it's just you know from an outsider's perspective you think well look what look how much your mom suffered do you want to do the same stuff do you want to go down the same line but for them it's almost inevitable that they're going to go down the same line because they were brought up that way that's what the behavior was modeled that's what the experience was that's how they saw that an adult dealing with issues or you know emotional issues was through taking to the bottle um as a release so it's uh slightly unrelated but no Bazi, I, re- I really do think it is related and and it, and it touches on whatever your experience has been i think at any point in life you have to try and develop the awareness of is my mind working to my advantage or is it working to jeopardize me because it is capable of doing both things it can jeopardize you or it can it can really take you forward um and sometimes by reenacting either past behaviors or um, thoughts or actions triggered by trauma we've experienced we can actually jeopardize our life but actually you know what is one of the important things about sikhi is actually getting that gyan for example with under alcohol it's the it's the understanding of how does it impact the psyche why is it such a destructive thing um you know if it's the fake baba thing it's actually the the lesson about the ego if it is about you've been through a bad experience is actually recognizing you know what the whole world's like this the whole world's like this there's maybe a um, few people that aren't but these things happen in all over the world and every culture so it's taking to the pursuit of of knowledge and trying to better yourself and transform yourself through that if you don't do that then you leave yourself to that part of the mind that can just jeopardize itself repeatedly as well in the same ways what are your thoughts on having expectations in others because this is something that dash was talking about the other day about in a in a relationship in a marriage in a partnership a lot of dukk a lot of suffering comes out of when you expect this person to do like this or behave a certain way and they don't do that and just going on what you were think talking about earlier i think sometimes we have expectations of this saint or this person is going to is going to be the solution to my problems and is going to solve all my issues on one hand on the other hand which it might be completely unrelated but with with me for example i saw a lot of my family members uh modeling kind of um alcoholic behavior and so then a lot of the the good six modeled the opposite behavior because their path was on on like a bhakti marg and so they they helped me see a different way of life and a different potential potential outcome so i think that can be really powerful but again it might go back to expectation like what do you want to get out of this this interaction what you, and then are you setting yourself up for failure when you think this person is going to be infallible they're going to be perfect and they're going to solve all my yeah. issues I, I think that's such an important point. I think from a expectation is we should have some expectation. Um we should have expectation of of safety of mutual respect of, of all of these things. But beyond that I think we should always know that when we have any expectation especially over things that we have no control for example other people that that expectation is leaving yourself open to um, to getting hurt. leave you so open to getting hang- angry and if you actually live with that no expectation or very little expectation i think it's a happier way to live i think it's a much better way to live when you've got no expectation and it's it's part of that as being in hokum as well isn't it mm. don't get me wrong i'm not telling anyone to to cut a difficult or abusive relationship but i'm saying you know the way people talk about if you know the key to happiness isn't by obtaining more it's by learning to live with less the expectations the same kind of thing for me where it's like what are what what is it that you need what is the minimum that you need in order to build a life together or within yourself knowing that actually your purpose in this life according to sikhi is to find parmatma within you your expectations that there'd be something a you would want maybe someone to have the same expectation or at least work together in a way where you can work towards that and with a marvelous i think what's the expectation that you should have know what you're looking for 
If you want, if you want to learn kickboxing, go to a kickboxing class. If you want to learn kirtan, then go to a ragi. If you want to learn part, go to a party. If you want to do simran, go to someone that does simran. If you if you want to be with someone that just hangs around and has a good time, then that's what because whatever your expectation is, if you're true and honest to that and what you what you're seeking, then you can find it. But it, if you get it wrong, then it might not be what you thought it was going to be. I love that. And I think I think uh having clarity around that is really important. Um because you know you don't know if you've got there, if you don't know where you're going, right? If you have that clarity in that relationship, you're not gonna you know that okay, this is a social thing, this is meeting my psychological need for for connection or being part of a society, but it's this isn't these aren't like Gur six for the sake of what Gurbani is talking about, Satsanga Tagesi Jani Tekonamakani, that this is someone I can watch football with. They they might be a sing and they might, you know, uh have that appearance and that's great, but the relationship that we have is more of a social one. It's not uh and, and you know even just on things like I'll give you an example. So I probably with so I, in my own experience, like Sangat for me is 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 something I had time with, time with that, and, and it's really important to me. But it's that thing, isn't it? It's Jateko Nam Bakani, and it's recognizing that that's your sacred space. If you want to chill with people, or you want to watch it, do you need friend circles? But there's maybe like when you respect that, I think it's important. It gives you structure because then you've also got your family, you've also got your career. You've also some things, maybe got clients. You've got all of these things in your life. And the more you can kind of structure those things and have those boundaries, I think can help be a more stable, better, rounded person. So that's the other thing, like, you know, I was thinking about having friends from different groups, etc. Try and be like a rounded, grounded person, not where your whole life comes about one thing or one person. You know, it's, if you get sick here, you get numb from there, then maybe put that thing first and devote that. But make sure you got a base as a person. I really like that. This is a, a wonderful conversation and I'm resonating and nodding because when I got into sick here, I stopped Thai boxing and I stopped training. And those were some really good friends and they probably kept me grounded and they probably helped me in in terms of psychologically just having that re, those relationships that i've known people for 20 30 years of my life and we've been th- through so much and they've been through they've been there for me through so much and they've been such a positive influence on my life so i think that that compartmentalization i think is quite a useful framework for me to think about okay this is my work and these are my work colleagues and this is our goal and this is our expectations as an organization and then this is my sangat and we want to progress spiritually so this is what my expectations are and this is some of the framework i have around this relationship that when we're together we're going to keep them or simran we're not just going to do fatu galla and bring each other down in that way and and you know and so i think that's a really useful framework for me because i have quite a simple mind um <laughs> I know I've taken a lot of your time, but I have this question that I've been dying to ask you. And it's a loaded question. And it's about, there's a saying, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. So what are your thoughts around the kind of unequal weighting of power in a relationship? And does that always corrupt? Or in your experience, are there people who can wield that power for the good? I don't know. (laughs) If I'm honest. Uh, I think I would always like to think that some people can or people could, they could have that power. Look, I would always like to think that, but then I don't know. And actually, one of the things is in the Hang Seng, you're taught and try to practice that quality of the ag, that even if power comes to you, like you shouldn't take it. You, you're, you're part of your, your living, your abhyas, your sadhana, is that to be the agi. Is that yeah, that thing's there, but no, I'm not interested. Like just because it's there, you don't need to take it. Just because it's successful, just because you're qualified, doesn't like if you seek out that thing and you get it, I think it will rot you. Um, you know, I remember 
you know, there's so many stories I've learned, but I think it comes down to it's that humility, isn't it? The famous story we hear of um, Nawab Kapoor Singh, and they're like, the Pant, we need, we need to make someone a Nawab, we need to elevate someone in Zahra. And uh, the older things are all sitting there, I think deciding who, and it's like, oh, there's that, there's that young one, Kapoor Singh, he's quite feisty. <laughs> he's, 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 you know, developed quite a reputation for himself, and, and let's call him over. And, you know, what was his seva? It was either cleaning the horses and, and um, their waste, or it was doing waving the fan over the sangat. And he said, I'll, I'll, you know, eventually when he was talked into it by Baba Deep Singh Ji, Baba Durbara Singh, and other senior Singhs, like, no, you're taking this title, <laughs> we're giving it to you. It was okay on the condition that I still get to do my seva of tending to the horses and these type of things. Where, and that really resonated with one thing Baba Zyinda Singh sent, said to me, and it's a personal story, but that's all I've got to share. It's my experiences and my stories. For a lot of people, you know, they they represent, and for certainly the older traditions, the Nirmala, the Adasis, etc., as the person that was elected to continue the ancient leadership of the Pant. And I remember I said to them once, and they said to me, they, they goes, Bandata bandai hunda, a man is only a man. They goes, we have a leader, Guru Granth Sahib Ji, what's the point of fighting over because the rest of us are just sevadar. The rest of us are just servants. We're only here to serve. Why are we going to get involved in who's bigger, who's smaller? He's got more than me. He goes, this is, I'm not interested. I'm not why like, and that's the thing, you know, what it made me realize is maybe it's maybe you don't get perfect people that will get power. Maybe power will corrupt everyone. And, and maybe some people realize that, so they're like, no, we're not interested. We're quite happy in what we do. You know, there's a saying that Baba Lerna Singh used to say to Baba, it was Baba Ji in the Singh's Chucha Mensa Gurudev. It was Tapo Raj, Rajo Nark. The top three, your efforts, your sadhana, your kumai, your, your qualities, your, your whatever you do, you can obtain Raj, you can obtain power. But Tapo, nark, eh, tapo Raj, Rajo Nark. From that Raj, though, you end up in Nark. So it's maybe it will always just corrupt people. <laughs> maybe the belief that we have that there will be some people that can wield it. You know, there, there have been, there have been, you know, Guru Sahib, etc. But if we look in our history, where there was power, there was also, you know, we can look in our history and if we're critical enough, should be able to recognize that doesn't sound right. Or maybe in a different time, it would have been better to have done that that way. We, and that's, teaches us that when it comes to power it starts getting messy mm. it starts wrong decisions can lead to bad consequences and maybe the best thing if you're a Gursik that wants to meet Paramatma on this life is to just be like nah <laughs> I'm not interested I've really enjoyed this conversation buddy I could talk to you for hours and uh, <laughs> listen to you for hours and thankfully I, I will be because you'll be doing Sima for basics as well in the coming weeks um, but he, where can people hear more of your vichar? Um, I'm going to try and focus more on just doing um, programs in Gurdwari. I think it's important that Sangat comes in the presence of Guru Granth Sahib Ji, uh, you know, has Langa come together to do Simran. So, you know, there's, there's a YouTube page, Kalsa Panti UK. That's the... That's what I was told to do, Pracharanda by Babaji. You've just used a kind of collective banner of Khalsa Pant and, you know, trying from my time there of the history that I learned from them um, and, 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 and a lot of the other older things, just to try and make those teachings from Gurbani and the history and the oratrician accessible. But I want to do it in, in the Gurdwara Sahib because it brings people to Maharaj, it gives an opportunity to do the Simran and Sangat, and that, that's that's what we want to encourage. So I would encourage people to come to that as and when they see it. But yeah, there's a Khalsa Pant YouTube page, and I think going forward, I think it's going to move more towards that in terms of content. and stuff. Amazing. I'll add a link to everything that you're putting out on the YouTube page in the description box below. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It was nice to speak to you. And thank you for the challenging questions. I think we do need to ask challenging questions. You know, it certainly made me think and challenge my own understanding and opinion on a lot of things. Um, so to thank you for putting them to me. Thank you. Thank you.